All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, you can see my screen here. Um, we'll be also switching the screens in between um, as Anton takes over in, in between. And uh, so please bear with us. Um, so uh, we're going to be talking about Spark and Iceberg at Apple uh, at Apple scale a little bit. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about um, why do we need upsets and deletes and uh, what's the plan for doing upsets and deletes using Iceberg. Um, a little bit about us, uh, Anton. We can't hear you. Hey, guys. Uh, so my name is Anton. I am a software engineer focusing on data lakes. And uh, we ensure that data lakes are efficient and reliable at Apple Cloud Services. And I'm also a PMC member for Apache Iceberg and Apache Spark contributor. Thanks, Anton. Uh, my name is Vishwa. I'm an engineering manager and lead here at Apple Cloud Services Data Orchestration and Data Lake Teams. A um, little bit about us. Um, so we are part of Data Orchestration and Data Lake Team. Um, the overarching org that we are part of provides a data platform uh, to all of Apple. Uh, we primarily focus on Apache Spark, uh, Iceberg, and Airflow. Uh, we have committers and PMC members for all three of these. Um, we contribute to open source Spark heavily. We uh, have contribute to Iceberg and uh, as well as to Airflow. Um, with respect to customers, we have users from all over Apple, starting from Siri to Maps to Apple Media Products, iCloud, iTunes, hardware engineering, and various uh, different data engineering and data science teams all across Apple. Um, agenda today, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, Spark and Iceberg infrastructure at Apple, um, uh, upsets and delete related requirements. Uh, uh, how do we do upsets and deletes in Iceberg and few key takeaways? Um, Spark and Iceberg at Apple. Um, we do have another session later today at 10:35 where we'll be talking more about uh, the history of data infrastructure at Apple, how we have evolved over a couple of years, um, focusing on all the other pieces of data infrastructure as well. Uh, however, in this talk, we'll primarily focus just on Spark and Iceberg. So diving right into Spark, um, we provide scalable, elastic, on-demand Spark as a service. Uh, we launched it back in 2018. Uh, since then, we have about a uh, few hundred thousand jobs that we run every day. We have over three million executors that start every day. Um, they use somewhere around four petabytes of RAM um, uh, across various different data centers uh, of Apple. We do have a lot of Spark that runs on YAN as well. So as we are trying to modernize the infrastructure, a lot of these workloads have moved off of YAN onto the uh, Spark as a service. Um, platform that we are providing. Uh, but however, we do have a lot of YAN workloads, Spark workloads that run on YAN. Uh, we do provide an internal distribution of Spark uh, that people use on YAN, basically. Few features that we provide for Spark as a service. Uh, one of the core principles here is to make sure we enable disaggregated architecture. Disaggregation is basically about disaggregating storage and compute so that you can scale up storage separately and compute uh, separately. More about it in the next talk. Um, uh, we provide an enhanced Spark runtime, uh, a lot of libraries that we develop internally. Some of them are available externally as well, are part of the Spark runtime. Uh, we support multiple versions of Spark. Users can choose to uh, jump between the versions, test out different versions, and upgrade as needed. We provide secrets and network ACLs so that you can connect to restricted networks, private networks. Um, uh, and such uh, service discovery and routing. You can uh, discover and connect to different drivers and, and jobs uh, through service discovery and routing. Application identities. Um, each job that comes up comes with its own uh, cryptogra cryptographically signed certificates. So um, you, you can be sure when you connect to a particular job what connectivity it has in between. Uh, deployments and version control. We support deployments and version control to uh, productionize run in the dev and integration environments and productionize it in prod environments. Scheduling and cron support, um, uh, authentication handling and authorization handling. Users who 
um, own certain jobs. They can only see their own jobs. So it comes as part of the platform here, audit and efficiency. We provide a lot of audit logs and also with respect to efficiency, a lot of tools that we give to automatically right size your jobs basically. Some of the jobs that run uh, use over petabyte of data and, and they do shuffle, which is in 500 to 600 terabytes of shuffle uh, for each run. So efficiency kind of helps, uh, efficiency tools help them to figure out uh, how they can tune their Spark jobs, profile their Spark jobs and such. Switching gears to Iceberg, um, uh, the current status of Iceberg, we have several prod use cases that are running in prod. Um, uh, one of the use cases that uh, is in prod has about two to three petabytes of data per table. Um, tens of tables there and over 2.5 million files uh, are more in each of these um, each of these tables and and most queries are returned within somewhere about 5 second response time so the so the the the, uh, the query response times we are aiming for is is somewhere in few seconds um, so this kind of fits the SLOs there um, some of the primary requirements that we have to, to build data lake on top of Iceberg, uh, obviously the obvious requirements here are lightning fast queries, uh, transactional upsets and deletes. We're gonna be doubling down on this later in the talk here, asset compliance on any object store or distributed file systems, um, and uh, of course automatic compaction and table management. So we have a separate service that kind of automatically keeps uh, tables compacted, uh, manages the table data as well as uh, metadata to prune it, um, uh, keep it clean, um, expire snapshots and, and, and things like that. Some of the current features that we support as part of this are, are asset compliance for all operations, uh, flexible indexing capabilities that comes out of the box for Iceberg here, uh, support for update deletes and upsets, support for batch and streaming use cases, data and metadata compaction commands, uh, as well as automatic compaction here, support for time travel, data provenance. We have metadata tables that you can query. Uh, utilities that can migrate existing Parquet and Avro tables without any uh, ETL jobs, basically. Uh, support for SQL and interactive queries using notebooks is, is quite important as well. So, um, so the, the data lake platform that we have built currently supports all these features. Uh, as you currently know, uh, Iceberg, is in, is integrating in better ways with Spark as Spark 3.0 comes out and evolves itself out. Uh, with Spark 2.x, the integration is is not so great. Some of these commands are not supported in open source yet, so we have support for them internally as well. Um, Absurd and delete requirements. Uh, some of the functional requirements here are um, um, to support read and write heavy OLAP use cases. Uh, the, one of the primary focus that we have been having here at Apple is to make sure that we support tables which are multi petabytes in size and and um, 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 and updates and deletes that happen affect multiple um, partitions, a large number of partitions and a large subset of data. So that has been the primary focus basically. So, so we have to be supporting um, uh, updates that can uh, update a large portion of the tables. Full support for update, delete, and merge commands. Uh, one of the things here is we want our users to be able to use the same uh, SQL commands they are familiar with. So we have added a full update, delete, and merge support. This is gonna be available in Spark 3.0 as it comes out as well. Anton is gonna be talking more about it. Um, efficient, non-conflicting, concurrent operations. Uh, we have tons of use cases where data flows in from multiple regions where you would be updating same table with, from multiple streams. So um, one of the, it's possible that the updates that come in can be updating two different parts of uh, the tables. So uh, having non-conflicting uh, non con concurrent operations um, is, is very, very important. Configurable uh, isolation levels. Iceberg already provides um, uh, really good isolation level in the form of all operations are serializable in Iceberg. So that's the best form of isolation that any database can provide. However, when, when you have large amount of writes and reads happening, you can also switch to um, a snapshot isolation and that provides um, better write uh, performance um, while 
is happening. Ability to stream out row level uh, changes incrementally is also a quite important feature that we've been looking for so that uh, if, if you you can basically replay the um, events that has happened on one table onto another table of iceberg basically. Some of the non-functional requirements are um, the, the architecture, um, one of the main goals is to have a, have a simple and scalable architecture. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you think about upsets and acid, uh, acid compliance and upsets is that why not build a system that uh, that can use log structured merge trees or something similar to what Cassandra, HBase, and other um, columnar databases currently uh, provide. And and it it often comes at a cost. Basically, the architecture becomes somewhat complicated. It can only um, it can only serve some uh, amount of data. The tables cannot be in petabytes. It can only be in in hundreds of terabytes. If if we go with that architecture. It also comes with the cost that you have to manage different set of processes, the processes that are uh, that man manage quorum, that has caching and everything. So the prime requirement for building the data lake for us is to have a simple and scalable architecture, and Iceberg provides that. Um, and 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 the next requirement here is no change for file power, file format. So we we Apple already has exabytes of data stored in our data uh, in our data where in our data lakes, and we don't want to be um, replaying the entire data set into a new format. Basically, so if we're using a Parquet and Avro, we want to be able to continue to use same file formats. Actually, I think the open um, uh, open data architecture and open file formats are quite important. Um, upsets and deletes in iceberg. So uh, that's what, that was all about how we have been uh, looking at um, Spark and uh, iceberg uh, within within Apple. And uh, from this point on, I let Anton talk a little bit about upsets and deletes uh, implementation of how it's implemented in iceberg and what our plans are for future. Thanks, Anton? Vishram. Um, let me share my screen. Are you guys able? Are you guys able to see it? Yes. All right, cool. Um, so before I actually dive into the actual implementation, I want to also walk through the um, SQL uh, syntax for uh, update, delete, and merge into, because I will refer to that syntax later in my presentation. So delete statement is fairly simple. We are familiar with it from the uh, relational world, where you have specify which tables you want to modify. And then you provide the condition which may or may not contain subquery. Delete or update is kind of similar. So um, you also provide a very condition which may or may not contain subquery. And in addition to that, you provide a set of assignments that, that define how you would like to modify the existing table. Merge into is a bit more complicated. Um, there are different variations to start with. Uh, I'll use the one that's available in Spark, which I think is, was also copied from Hive. Um, here, you first start by, by specifying which table you would like to modify. Then you have to provide the source relation that actually contains your changes. Um, this can be a reference to temporary view or temporary table or any arbitrary subquery you may want. Next, you have to provide the merge condition. And emerge condition defines whether rows in the source relation actually match rows in the target relation. Alongside that, you may specify an optional predicate on the target column, um, which will be used to pre-filter the target table before executing the statement. And this is really important for the overall performance of this operation. And I'll come back to this um, later in my presentation. If you have a match between a record in your source relation and an existing record in your table, you have three options. You can update the existing record, you can delete it, or you can keep it as is. If there is no match between uh, the source row and the target row, then you can decide to insert the row that you didn't fi find the match for, or you can also ignore it. Keep in mind that not all of the branches are required at the same time. Uh, so you need at least one in order to successfully execute a merge into statement. So to summarize, merge into is a very flexible way to perform inserts, updates, and deletes in the same command. Now, if you take a look how different systems um, 
handle updates and deletes internally, you will be able to split their approaches into two main groups, copy and write and merge and read. In copy and write, you, all, you do all of the work um, on write, and in merge and read, you do as less work as possible on write, and then you apply the differences while reading the data set. Each of these approaches has its own benefits and drawbacks, and they really work well in specific use cases. As we wanted to have a generic solution inside Iceberg, the community has decided to support both implementations. And for Merge and Read, we have decided to use differential files. It's a concept that was introduced by the research community around 40 years ago, but is still widely, widely adopted. Um, it allows you to avoid materializing the updates on write. Um, but also, it does not require you to run a set of standalone processes somewhere in your cluster and coordinate, make sure they are fault tolerant, and so on. So it kind of contributes to the overall simplicity in the architecture while actually achieving the same goal. Um, and this was, again, really important for us as we didn't want to build another, uh, another database. And to give even more flexibility to our users, we actually support different types of uh, differential files, which I will describe later in the presentation as well. So a quick summary of this slide is that Iceberg will support three ways to update and delete your data, and that should cover all reasonable analytical use cases. As Wishwa mentioned, so we want to cover both read and write heavy use cases in the analytical world. The first approach I want to talk about in detail is copy and write. So the main idea here is that if you have to modify, uh, if you have to delete a, a record from a file, you have to copy that file, delete the record, produce a new data file, and then atomically replace the old file with the, um, with the new one. It's a fairly simple concept, but yet uh, combined with all other logic in Iceberg, you can use it to build a, a relatively efficient merge into implementation. The first step during this, uh, under this model would be to um, do partition and file pruning. Whenever a user executes a merge into statement in a query engine like Spark, Iceberg will look for predicates on the target column. And it will use those predicates to uh, to actually prune partitions and even more prune files within those partitions using the min-max statistics that, is, that it has in its metadata. And I would like to emphasize that this filtering happens without actually touching the data. So it gives us a cheap way to pre-filter the target table and find out which files may have matches. So therefore, I, I highly advise you to structure your table um, in a way that you will be able to benefit from partition and file, uh, file skipping in Iceberg. Once we have this information, the next step is to perform the cardinality check. And the SQL standard requires an exception to be thrown if multiple rows in the source relation match the same row in the target. If this happens, the result of your command is actually indeterministic. Um, so you cannot really like decide what the correct way to execute it. And therefore, um, while it's still expensive because you have to do an extra inner joint, it's always a good idea to perform this because otherwise you risk to actually corrupt your data. The good part about this is that while doing the cardinality check, we can actually collect file names that contain matches. And this can help us to limit the scope of this operation even further. Um, so in step one, we started with files that may have matches, which we kind of determined based on the available metadata. And during step three, we actually know which files must be rewritten. So after this step, every file that we will rewrite will actually have a record that must be updated. So once we have this information, uh, we need to perform an outer join. In the worst case, this will be a full outer join. Um, in certain cases, depending how you structure your branches, this can be a right outer join as well. But in generic case, it's a full outer join because you have to copy over the records that didn't match. Um, 
And once you have the joint relation, you ha actually have to materialize different branches you have. You have to update the records, you have to insert new records, and you have to delete some of them as, 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 uh, as per user configuration. Once you have the new state, you have to write it into a set of new data files. All of this is done by a query engine like Spark. And in the final step, you actually have to atomically replace the files that you read with the files that you produced that contain updated records. And during this step, Iceberg will verify what happened since the moment you read till the time you commit. And it will act according to the configured isolation level. Um, the main benefit of this approach is it's easy to implement. There is no extra work in read, so your reads are as efficient as they were before updates and deletes. And it works really well for bulk updates. If you have use cases where you update 80% of a file, um, then it's not a big deal to actually copy over 20% extra and, and write it in one go. Because after that, you, you basically have the same efficient um, representation of your data. The worst case for this approach is if you have to modify um, a couple of records in a large number of files. In this scenario, you actually copy over a lot of files that you didn't want to, or did you, you didn't intend to modify in the first place, right? And um, this makes it too expensive for write heavy use cases because writes are um, taking too much time. So I have a couple of tips how to make this implementation scalable. Um, first of all, I definitely advise to try to cache the relation that contains your changes that you would like to merge. Um, it's a good idea for a number of reasons. So first of all, it will ensure that you get the same consistent result every time you query the source relation. And it's actually required by, by the execution because the source relation is scanned multiple times, so it must produce the same result. So caching is one way to achieve that. Um, apart from that, uh, because the source relation is kind of joined multiple times with the target table during the execution, if you can pre-cache it, then it also gives you a uh, better performance because you don't want to re-evaluate some of the predicates on, on, on that sub-query. You just want to use the cached variant of, of it. Apart from that, I definitely advise to think about what partition and sort key predicates you may have. Um, in many, many cases, you're actually not targeting um, updates across all of the table. Um, in many cases, what I've seen in, in practice is that you are trying to update some recent part of the table, let's say five, 10 months, last months of data. And if you have data for, let's say, five years, by thinking about correct partition and sort key predicates, you can actually um, uh, limit the scope of that operation and discard a lot of data without actually uh, touching it. Also, I would definitely advise to look into the broadcast thresholds you have um, for your uh, query engines. If you can leverage broadcast joins, uh, this will make your life much, much easier. And last point is try to explore the metadata uh, tables in Iceberg. They contain a ton of useful information and especially the snapshots table in this case. It will tell you what operation happened, um, how many records you modified, how many records you added, what's the total number of records right now. And this will be a good way to kind of understand what happened in, in the merge operation. All right, that was copy and write. Um, in the next section, I'm going to cover merge and read. And the main concept we had to introduce to support merge and read in Iceberg is a delete file. So a delete, a delete file tells us which records were removed from our data set. And instead of copying and modifying data files directly, you can now mark deleted records uh, by writing and producing your delete files. Those delete files, they will be applied while you're reading the data set. Um, and producing a delete file is um, substantially more efficient than 
modifying the data file directly. Um, so under this model, an update is represented by a append in both delete file, which kind of removes old version of the row and data files, which contains the updated record. And at selected points in time, you actually have to perform compactions. And a compaction may be a minor compaction or a major compaction. The goal of a main minor compaction is to optimize the number and layout of small delete files. And the goal of a major compaction is to actually get rid of delete files completely by merging them into the corresponding base file. Your delete files must somehow reference rows in the target table. And this can be done using two ways, either using natural keys or using synthetic keys. Um, a natural key is a key that consists of one or more column values. And if you want to represent a generic update using a natural key, you face a couple of problems. And by generic use case, I mean um, an update like, like you see in SQL command, uh, where you can modify an arbitrary field and you may have an arbitrary condition. So you are not limited to condition on, on, only on the natural key. So in this case, it's, it's hard to represent that operation using an HL key. Um, first of all, not all of the data sets actually have um, a unique, globally unique natural key. Second, um, you have to reason about key uniqueness. Uh, and it's challenging and expensive, especially at scale. If you are to do this check and write, this would mean you would have to join the existing data set with the incoming data set, find if there are duplicates which is expensive because you need to execute that distributed join. Um, if you are to do this check on read, you would have to probably sort the records not only by the natural keys, but also um, by some additional column that would represent the version of the row. And then you would pick the last one. In both cases, it's expensive and it adds more complexity to the overall implementation. Um, in addition, the size of delete files in case of natural keys depends on how many columns you use as a natural key and on their size. Um, so the more columns you use as a natural key, the bigger size you have for your delete files. And final, it kind of limits the read optimizations you may have. Um, so the consensus we have arrived in the community is that um, supporting natural keys for generic use cases is probably not the best idea, um, but but there are definitely very important use cases where you want to use them um, over positional uh, keys and you still want to cover them. So therefore the decision was that we will support both. The synthetic key in case of Iceberg is actually a combination of a file pass and row position. And such keys ensure uniqueness of rows without any extra work on read or write. So it, it's a very, efficient way to uniquely identify a row. And also they have fixed size of the delete files because you always have just two columns and they kind of always the same size. And because all of that flexibility uh, that, that you get, um, most of the systems, like if you consider MongoDB, Vertica, others, uh, they leverage synthetic keys. Even high asset tables in V1 and V2 version, they all leverage synthetic keys. But there is very important distinction in synthetic keys in Iceberg compared to Hive Asset. Hive Asset stores an extra column in the data files. For Iceberg, synthetic key is implicit. So there is no extra metadata information in the data files, which is again a very important point for us. The only drawback of a synthetic key is that you have to read the target table in order to produce a positional delete which may not be a big deal if you have to read the table anyway to execute a merge into statement. And this is actually true in a generic case, but there are edge cases where you can produce your delete files without actually reading the target table. And this is something that you can address with natural keys and you cannot do with synthetic keys. So as I said before, therefore the community has decided to use synthetic keys for generic use cases. Um, and use natural keys for some edge cases where you can generate delete files without, without touching the target table. And to give you a couple of examples where what I actually mean by, by generic use case, um, let's explore this one. So here we have a merge into statement um, 
with equality on partition column and ID. And if there is a match between the source and target table, we would like to check if the value of the, of the existing row in, in, in the count field is less than 10. And then if that's true, then we would like to modify one single time column in the existing uh, record. In order to find out the new representation of the row with all updates, you actually need to know the values for other columns that that row has. The only way to find that out is by reading the target table. In addition, you have to apply that predicate less than 10 on the count field, which is again only possible if you read the target table. So in this case, you have to read the target table anyway, so there is no extra penalty to actually read the synthetic key um, while you're reading the data. Now compare this to this example. We have equality only on ID, and we are doing this merge operation only a specific partition. And we are saying that update all matching records with the record I have in my source relation. So here, we don't really care about the uniqueness of the key. You can have uh, 10 records with the same ID, and you just want to update all of them, right? And you actually have the new representation of row you want to replace it with. It's in your source relation. So in this case, what you can do and what the iceberg will do is it will produce a delete file that will contain unique IDs uh, so that it will discard all versions of those rows. And it will produce new data files um, with updated records and all of that without actually reading the target table, which makes the write as lightweight as possible. Now I would like to talk a bit about how that, that is actually represented in the table format. As you know, Iceberg keeps both forward and backward compatibility within the same table format version, which, um, which means that um, you had to introduce the V2 table format for merge and read. Um, but before diving into V2, I would like to actually walk through the V1 format and make sure we are on the same table. And just one side note is the upgrade to V2 is a simple configuration change. You just bump the table format version and you're done. The, the migration, is, so the V2 format is backward compatible, uh, but once you migrate, you cannot actually use your V1 writers to write to V2 tables, but the opposite is kind of true. So in V1, um, there was a notion of a snapshot in Iceberg. And a snapshot tells us uh, which data files were present at a particular point in time. And then the metadata for different data files in a particular snapshot is spread across um, different manifest files. Um, and the manifest file is a really important concept in Iceberg. It provides us metadata for a group of data files. And each entry in the manifest file actually contains the file location, the partition tuple, min-max statistics, file size, and other useful information that, that may be used during job planning or other operations. Um, usually, a single manifest covers from two to 5,000 of data files. And whenever we, we write a new version, whenever we produce a new snapshot, we will have a new manifest list. But the important part is that manifest list might actually reference some of the old manifests um, and actually new ones as well. This allows us to have cheap commits in Iceberg and rewrite only what changed in terms of metadata and inherit most of the table state from the previous snapshot. In order to support um, positional deletes or deletes in general, we had to introduce a notion of a delete file for the two spec. Um, and delete file actually contains the, uh, the rows that, that were removed. We also had to extend the manifest metadata with the field called content. It now tells whether the manifest contains either data or delete files. You cannot have the same manifest that provides you both data and delete files because of the way how job planning works. Uh, we've also extended the manifest entry metadata with uh, content field as well, and it tells us whether it's a data file, positional delete, or an equality delete. 
And uh, a single manifest can actually contain multiple delete files so that the same table might have uh, different delete types as well. So you're not limited to one approach within a table. You can actually use all three approaches inside. And what is also important to note is that delete files are scoped to partitions um, so that you can prune partitions while, while job planning just as you do for data files. And in addition, all records uh, in positional delete files, they are sorted by the file name and we keep min-max statistics uh, for delete files in the metadata so that we can not only print partitions, but also filter out delete files as we can filter out data files. And this ensures that we kind of filter out as much as we can during job planning and don't touch deletes that do not apply to a specific query. In order to support equality deletes, we had to introduce the sequence number and the sequence number tells us the relative age of a delete or data file. It is necessary because once you produce those delete files, you actually want them to apply uh, to data files that were older than this. And uh, equality deletes are also scoped to partitions um, so that you can uh, do uh, partition filtering as well. In case of equality deletes, you also have a metadata column called equality IDs. It specifies which column IDs were used as the key for this specific delete operation. It gives you extra flexibility so that you are not really limited to a specific key to perform your deletes, right? You can have different delete operations and you can still encode them using equality deletes. And the content of uh, equality delete files it actually contains the values for uh, for the columns that were used as keys. The main benefit of uh, merge and read is that it makes your writes lightweight, and it it ensures that the amount of data you have to write is proportional to the number of records you modify, which was not really the, the case for uh, copy and write. The main drawback is that it does affect the read performance you have um, because there will be an extra work on, on during job planning to locate which data files you need to read. Plus there is extra work while reading, reading the file um, because you have to filter the records that were deleted. Also, it's harder to implement. It requires V2 format in Iceberg and it works well only if the size of the delete file is small enough. If you're kind of deleting this approach, using this approach to delete 80% of the records in the file, this is not the best use case. And in addition, it requires minor and major compaction, which adds more complexity to the way you manage your tables. Now I wanna talk a bit about the status of this uh, in open source and both internally at Apple. Um, we've been running the copy and write implementation for more than a year internally based on the design doc that we've created um, in open source. The only reason why we didn't do this in open source directly is because of the data source v2 limitation in Spark 2. Spark 3 has proper data source v2 and it also has the logical plans for update, delete, and merge. So we are already working to kind of contribute this back to open source so you can expect a fully available and working solution in Iceberg directly was in one month from now. Merge and read is still kind of in progress. So we've completed all of the table format changes. You can create a delete file in both equality and both positional delete files. Job planning is in place, so there will be different filtering. Um, and actually that delete file will be applied if you read from, uh, from Spark. The missing part that we currently have is the logic in Spark that would produce those delete files in distributed fashion, right? Uh, the logic that would do those uh, joins between the source and relation determine different conditions and what, what must be written into a delete file. And also we don't have uh, the implementation for minor major compaction. We have a plan how to do this, but uh, it's not yet implemented. So my personal um, prediction is that there will be a, a working prototype end to end by the end of the year. So I'd like to finish with a few key takeaways um, that I want you to remember from this presentation. First and foremost, different use cases require different approaches. Um, you cannot have a single approach that would 
work equally well for different use cases. And therefore, it is important for Iceberg to support different implementations. Um, and this gives extra flexibility to you to meet the requirements you have. We would advise to use copy and write for bulk updates if you have read heavy use cases. We would advise to use positional merge and read for generic write heavy use cases. And we would advise you to use equality merge and read for cases where you can skip reading the target table to produce your delete files. And one of such examples is absorbed by primary key. And definitely check out our opportunities. So we hire in different, uh, in different roles. Uh, we're looking for people who are experts in query engines like Spark and Presto. We're looking for experts in file formats like ORC, Parca, Avro, and uh, people who are also experts in Apache Arrow as well. All of that is really needed for our team. And we'll also be available in the booth uh, after the presentation. If you have any, any questions, just feel free to drop. And as Bishra said, we also have another presentation where we will talk about icebergs in detail about why we chose Iceberg and why, uh, what are the features that are really important for us. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys. Question with, for if, we, if anybody has any questions. And there was one question in the chat about uh, when would we have merge on reads uh, available? I think as uh, Anton mentioned, we're hoping to get the MVP out by uh, end of the year as much as possible. Uh, I think Spark 3 and uh, Spark 3's integration, so we're working on that. Um, yeah. There, there there is even like consensus on how that will look like. So um, there is a lot of progress, both on merge and read. Uh, on copy and write, I mean, it's done a year ago. So we just were waiting for the desserts uh, to, to be out. Um, and I think the design for merge and read kind of stabilizes during the last months. And uh, Brian Blue it did a lot of work to actually implement this uh, from the table perspective. And I will add the, the Spark related parts and it actually will share a lot of this copy and write in terms of what Spark does. Um, so I don't expect that to take much time. Awesome. Um, I, I don't see any other questions. So please do try out Iceberg. Um, uh, watch out for the changes that we're going to be putting out in OSS for upserts. Uh, it's quite exciting. Um, let us know if you have any other questions. We'll be in booth. Uh, feel free to reach out to us through Slack uh, or through email as well. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.